So we're going to run through and summarise some of the ideas that people had around the causes of disease between 1250 and 1500. And one of the things that we need to say about this is that some of their ideas were really old because they were based on the work of ancient Greek physicians like Hippocrates and Galen. And one particularly popular theory was around the four humours and the idea that the body was made up of four different fluids, blood and collar and black bile and phlegm and that disease was caused by an imbalance in these four humours. And that kind of made sense to people because they could see that when someone got ill they would perhaps bleed, they would perhaps vomit, they might get really snotty as if their body was trying to get rid of too much of something. Now, Galen in particular also emphasised the need for a good diet and exercise and also cleanliness, cleanness. Whoops, there we go. So we could perhaps say that the lack of these things were seen as being a cause of disease as well. And this is also an idea that comes through from Islamic scholars such as Ibn Sina, who was responsible for writing down a lot of the ideas of Hippocrates and Galen and really spreading them to Western Europe. So those ideas exist as well. And another reason why people tend to trust Galen is because those ideas we know actually work in terms of health. Now, there are ideas about disease as well coming from the church, the Roman Catholic Church in particular. And this taught people that disease might be caused by God. And that could be as a punishment because people had sinned. Or it could be because suffering was supposed to be good for your soul. So it might have been sent to purify you. The church also sometimes taught that disease was sent by the devil, who's God's enemy. In an attempt to make the world into a worse place. So... That was another explanation for disease that was given by the church. Now, we know that the church also tended to support and promote the ideas of Galen. And that's because Galen had a number of ideas, like the idea that there was one God who had created the human body, and like the idea that people had souls, that meant that the church agreed to some extent with him. So the church tended to promote Galenic medicine, to the point of sometimes putting people in prison if they ask too many questions about it. So the church is also feeding into ideas about the causes of disease. Another reason, or an, another reason that was given for disease in medieval times was the idea of what we call miasma. Now miasma is a bad, it's bad air. If you have more than one miasma, then we call it miasmata. Actually, people at the time tended not to use the word miasma that much. They tended to call it things like putrefication of the air. And this is the idea that disease can enter your body through your, your nose in the form of a bad smell. So where there was perhaps rubbish or sewage or a swamp, people would associate that with disease and they saw it as causing disease. In the same way, good smells were seen as healthy. And there is a bit of a religious link here because as well as being associated with health, they were also associated with holiness. So we see, for example, that the church tended to burn incense in its buildings to make the air smell nicer and holier and also healthier.
as well. Now this explains why people at the time, when people had diseases such as leprosy, it explains why people isolated them because they believed that they could catch that disease from the sufferer through their noses. It also, um, the disease of malaria, which is spread by mosquitoes, which often lived in swamps, is called, takes its name from the Italian for mala, which is bad, and area, which is air. So that's a disease that literally means, where its name literally means bad air. So miasma was seen as another cause of disease. A further cause of disease was often given as the stars and planets. Astrology played a massive role in the medieval understanding of medicine to the point where medieval physicians were really expected to know the movement of the planets and the moon at all times. Astrology is the, the movement of the planets and the stars through the sky and where they are placed and the angles that they make to each other. So diagnosis was often made and deciding what disease people had was often made by asking what their zodiac sign was. And each zodiac sign was associated with a part of the body. So, for example, if there was a bad planet, what they called a malefic, passing through the sign of Leo, that might cause problems with people's hearts. And this has a massive effect on the practice of medicine to the point where there are rules around when people are supposed to pick the herbs for their medicine um, and when they're supposed to administer medicine as well, depending on where the moon was and how it was moving through the different signs of the zodiac. Now, this also links in with the four humours theory because each of the four humours was associated with some of the signs of the zodiac as well. So astrology was seen as a really important part of medieval medicine as well. There is also a lot of work that goes on around what we call uroscopy, which is the study of urine, which is the posh word that we have for we. Now, this wasn't seen as causing disease, but it was supposed to be a good indication of what was wrong with people. And people would hand in a sample of their urine, which would go to a physician who would check it, perhaps against a chart like this one, for its colour and also its thickness and to see if there was anything floating in it and its smell and sometimes its taste and they would use that to decide what was wrong with the patient, usually referring it back to the theory of the four humours and using the urine to identify which humour there was too much of or not enough of as well. Finally, just to mention that there was also a school of what we call alchemists at work at the time. Now, these have a link to the church because they were often monks and priests, people with perhaps more education. And they tended to do work around substances. So they were often trying to find ways of turning ordinary metal into gold. Sometimes though, they were also trying to produce what they called the elixir of life, which is a substance that was supposed to promote perfect health and longevity. Obviously they don't succeed in this, but they do make some quite interesting discoveries. They're the first people, for example, to create hydrochloric acid. They learn how to identify various substances, such as arsenic, and their work really forms the basis of the modern study of chemistry. In fact, some of the equipment that they're designed to use in this is still used by chemists today. So it's a forerunner of chemistry. And from that point of view, it's quite important. Now, one of the things that you might notice when we're looking at this is that 
not much changes. I mean, some of these ideas are hundreds of years old um, and not much changes, changes between 1250 and 1500 when it comes to medical ideas. So there's a lot of what we would call continuity. Whoops. Ah, get rid of that before I try writing. Continuity. And there's a number of reasons why things don't change very much. A big one is the church. The church plays a massive role in keeping ideas about medicine more or less steady and preventing them from moving forward. And this is partly because it doesn't like challenges. It doesn't like new ideas that might threatens, pe threaten people's belief in God. Remember as well that the church often used disease and recovery as a way of proving that God existed. Because if he didn't exist, then why are you getting ill? So it's important to the church that it controls a lot of the ideas about medicine. And that causes a great deal of continuity. The church also really has a monopoly on the written word at this point, because the only people who can read and write really work for it. So the church gets to choose what is written down and what is read. Now, later on in the 1440s, Gutenberg in Germany invents the printing press. And the first printing press arrives in London in 1476. That doesn't have a direct impact on medicine, but it does mean that it's easier for people to communicate with each other through writing. Um, comes a bit too late to make a difference to this particular time period though. The church is also responsible for setting up various medical universities and schools of medicine. The first of these is in Salerno in Italy and it opens around about 900 AD. But again, the church controls these and it tends to be based on learning rather than experience. They do very occasionally in these universities practice something called vivisection, which is the dissection or the cutting up of dead bodies to see how they work. The problem is that the church doesn't really like the cutting up of dead bodies and it teaches that people need to be buried with their bodies when they've died. So when this happens, it doesn't happen very often. It happens to criminals who've been executed. And when it happens, the doctors don't actually do the cutting up. Somebody called a barber surgeon does the cutting. There he is with his knife. And the doctor would stand a little way off, perhaps teaching his students, reading from a book and giving instructions. So this isn't a process that's really designed to improve anybody's understanding or really challenge anybody's knowledge. And that perhaps prevents medical knowledge from moving on as well. Another problem that people have at the time when it comes to improving their medical knowledge is a lack of scientific understanding and technology. So they don't have things like microscopes, for example. And that makes things more difficult for them. And the other thing is because they don't have the scientific knowledge behind what they're doing, and they don't have scientific principles to apply, what they tend to do when they have new information, they tend to make it fit with the old theories. And again, that means that medical understanding and medical knowledge doesn't move on very much and there's a lot of continuity. The final thing to mention about this is attitudes. People at the time had a lot of respect for traditional ideas. They also, because most of them couldn't read, they also had a lot of respect for books and learning and for people who had learnt through books. 
So someone like Galen, who had written 350 books, was held up as somebody to be very much respected. And this is important for doctors. Even if they themselves don't agree with the theories of Galen, their patients will. And if they don't work to those theories, nobody is going to trust them. They're not going to go and visit them when they're poorly. And therefore the doctor won't make any money. So it's important for physicians, if they want to have a successful business, to follow these ideas as well. So all in all, there's quite a lot of reasons why ideas about the causes of disease between 1250 and 1500 don't change very much.